Welcome to Social Personality Development, Unit 2. In this unit, we're going to be talking about parenting. And the first thing we're going to talk about in parenting is the special bond between a parent and their infant, and that is known as attachment. We have lots of important relationships in our life, relationships with friends, coworkers, family members, but most theorists believe that the strength of those relationships starts with our very first relationship, and that is the relationship with our primary caregiver. Now, the study of attachment may be older than you think, and we're not going to go back the whole way, but we're going to start with Sigmund and Anna Freud. So Sigmund Freud and his daughter Anna, they really looked at how early experiences matter. Of course, one of the things that came out of a psychoanalytic approach to therapy was that a lot of patients would start to do what's known as transference during therapy. And this is the idea that if they had a conflict with someone in their life, be it a boss or a sibling or a romantic partner, they would begin to transfer the emotional energy they had towards that person onto the therapist. If they had a hard time talking with the person in their life or they perceived them as negative or judgmental, they would perceive the therapist as negative and judgmental. And this became most true when people would transfer the type of relationship they had with a parent onto the therapist. And Sigmund Freud noticed right away that the way people related to their mother was often how they related to their therapist. And that's why we see the common trope today with Sigmund Freud saying things such as, tell me about your mother. And so that's a lighthearted joke nowadays, but it actually made sense at Sigmund Freud's time and place in history. And that he found if there was some sort of emotional unconscious conflict with one's mother, this would impact many things that would come out in therapy. It might impact how well they succeed at work or relationships or how well they are a parent. It might impact how they cope with their emotions. So unpacking what people thought about their mother actually had a lot of usefulness for a lot of his patients. Of course, he also had the idea uh, through psychosexual development that when we're infants, we get a lot of our satisfaction through oral stimulation. And so this is through feeding. So whether you're being bottle fed or breastfed, it was often thought that the caregiver that is feeding you is giving you that need and they're helping you to fulfill that need. And that's what's creating this special bond. Now with Anna Freud, she was talking a lot about the biological unity between a caregiver and an infant. The idea that they act as one. Today in the cognitive developmental psychology, we know that infants of a certain age don't really know where they end and the universe begins. So they don't really know where they stop and their parent starts. And we also know there's lots of biological overlay between the two. If the infant cries, the caregiver will release lots of hormones and stress hormones to react uh, to the infant. They may lactate if they're breastfeeding. Uh, there's lots of interplay there. So although they are two separate beings, they act as one biological unit in a sense in that they sleep at the same time, they're always together, uh, and they are constantly acting and reacting to each other in a chemical way. Now, of course, the work by Freud and Freud was a great primer to start understanding that early experiences matter, early relationships matter, and there is some sort of chemical biological link between an infant and their parent. But then we go a little step further. So a psychoanalytic a theorist named by the name of Karen Hornet, uh, and as well as another theorist by the name of Melanie Klein, started to look at this mother-child or parent-child bond in a different bit of a lens. Rather than just looking at oral satisfaction, uh, they started to look at what's known as objects relations theory. And this is the idea that the type of relationship an infant forms with their primary caregiver will, will influence their internal working model, influence how they think about all relationships. And so the mother-infant relationship will start to impact all other relationships and all outward forms of attachment. So the object relations theory is the idea uh, that you start to understand how relationships work from this primary relationship. If you can feel like you can uh, be very reliant on your parent, or if you feel that you cannot rely on your parent, or if you feel you need to be over-reliant on your parent, that's gonna influence not just how an infant reacts to their mother, but also their teachers, especially if their early elementary teachers are women of uh, the same demographic as their mom. It's also how they're gonna inf influence the relationships with friends at school, and eventually it's gonna influence how you relate to your romantic partner and your spouse someday. And so this is the idea that this very early relationship is not just a matter of transference or a matter of conflict, but there's a cognitive model there called the internal working model that sees this relation as a bit of a cognitive concept or a cognitive schema. And this schema for relationships gets extracted and applied to all future relationships. 
So that's the work of Karen Hornet and Melanie Klein. After Hornet and Klein, we start to get into the ethological workings of John Bowlby. And so John Bowlby, he was very much interested in the evolutionary purpose of attachment. And so his view of attachment was that there must be some evolutionary adaptation for this. And he named what's known as the Cupid doll effect. And so the Cupid dolls were cute little plastic dolls that you could collect in the, I think it was the 1960s. It was before my lifetime. And they were very round, adorable dolls. One of the things about these dolls is they had very rounded features. They had big round eyes, they had big round cheeks, little round button noses, their arms were kind of rounded with some baby fat, they had round tummies, and their heads were just pretty much little spheres. And they were adorable. They didn't have any harsh figures. And no, no, undisputably, these dolls were cute. And so John Bowlby said, there's something about this cuteness factor that makes us want to take care of it. Babies are a lot of work. Babies will cry and poop and spit up all the time and bite, yet we find them adorable. And it's because of this roundness that there must be uh, this evolutionary and adaptive purpose to being attracted to want to care for something that's more round. We notice this in a lot of mammalian species. For instance, with dogs, we find that uh, a golden lab puppy has a shorter, more rounder muzzle. Its paws are a bigger proportion of its body, so its legs look a little bit more round and stubby. Its ears look a little bit more rounded. It has more of a round body. Versus when that dog grows up, it's more gangly and elongated. This is what happens to us when we become teenagers. All of a sudden we have these long arms and long legs. We no longer have this little roundness to us. And so it's the idea that we have this evolutionary drive to want to care of round things. So according to John Bowlby, the parents are invested in the parent-infant bond because the infant is cute and the parents like that. But what makes the infant interested? Is it the oral satisfaction uh, as Freud would recommend? What we actually find is the work of Harry Harlow suggests it's not the oral satisfaction, but it's the tactile comfort. And this is the idea that infants are attracted to cuddly things. And so, of course, his work with the rhesus monkey showed that the rhesus monkeys preferred uh, the monkey that was wrapped in a soft um, in a soft towel rather than the monkey who had a bottle but was in a wire cage. And so it shows that the infants really want something to cuddle. That, that sense of tactile comfort allows us to thrive. It gives us haptic stimulation and it helps our nervous system to mature. And it does seem to have a very survival evolutionary advantage to be around something that will be cuddly. Uh, and so this is why I like to name John Bowlby and Harry Harlow the cute and cuddly theorists. Uh, so parents are invested in the bond because babies are cute and babies are invested in the bond because parents provide them with cuddling.